Guys, welcome to Real Talk. My name is Jerry Miller. Thank you kindly for joining us. We are live in Charlottesville, the commonwealth, the country, and the world on the Isle of Seaville Network today, presented by Ross Mortgage, Scott Morris, and Ross Mortgage, who you want to call when you want to get that loan for your primary residence, an investment property, a beach house. Scott Morris, undoubtedly a trusted advisor in the mortgage game, guys. Judah Wickhauer is our director. And today's program, just from the conversation I had off air with Gary Palmer, is going to be absolutely fantastic. Judah, if you could go to the four shot when you're ready, and let's welcome our panel to the program. Scott Morris, Keith Smith, and Gary Palmer. Good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing? Good morning. Good morning, Amazing. guys. Thank morning. you for having us. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. We'll start with Gary Palmer, then I'll get out of the way. Gary, uh, before we talk shop, introduce yourself to everybody that's watching. I'm Gary Palmer. I'm principal broker owner of Town Realty, um, also a local developer, investor, uh, married to my beautiful wife, Ashley Palmer, and father of two. Uh, I got a four and a half month old, Laker, and a 12, 12 year old son, Noah. Fantastic. Recently married, got his hands in a lot of different, uh, a lot of different pots which we will identify. Scott Morris, jump in here um, with Gary Palmer and Keith Smith on today's show. Yeah, good morning, guys. Um, hearing that you vacation with both with small children is amazing to me. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I, I've, I think the park is a vacation uh, for, for that's, a, that's a lot of work. Maybe bro. the backyard. Backyard, that's right, that's right. <laughs> Um, no, that's awesome, man. I'm uh, just glad, uh, you know, uh, amazing start to the year so far. Glad to see everybody. Um, just, you know, want to get on, kind of like uh, talk through some. Keith's got some, hit me at like 6 a.m. this morning with some scenarios. Actually, it was earlier through. than that. <laughs> well, you know, I'm giving you a little credit, like, uh, for, uh, for today. So uh, I'm excited to kind of jump in and, and, and see what's out there for, for those that are looking and what we can do to help people buy some homes. So I'm excited to sit down and have a conversation with you, Gary. I've been wanting to do this forever. So thank you for setting this up, Scott. Um, we've been doing this for 260-something shows. I can't remember the number. And it's really great to have a developer on the table. I'm a recovering developer. Okay. So, I, so I'm, I'm, I've built like 600 homes in my career. So wow. I'm excited to yeah. geek out with you if the conversation, sure. conversation comes up. Yeah. What, what areas do you focus on mostly? Right now, um, well, my recent project is uh, over on Riverdale, sure. on East High Street. Uh, mm -hmm. Give them your background. I don't mean to interrupt. Okay, sure. Oh, started sure. In, in, uh, in integrity. Okay, yeah. So I, I moved here, went to JMU, moved here, um, started up Integrity Home Contracting with uh, John Struckman, um, did that for 10 years, sold out of that company. Um, while I was with Integrity, I would buy one or two rental properties a year, just dabbled in mainly single-family residential nothing crazy. I'd flip a home here or there. Um, and I realized about 10 years after being a contractor and yelling at contractors every morning that that just wasn't my thing, right? <laughs> that I, I enjoyed real estate. I wanted to go real estate full time. So in 2015, I kind of made the venture, um, quickly realized there was an opportunity for Town Realty to help friends and you know, people, you know, buy and sell houses. But I continued with the development. I continued investing. Um, my recent project right now is over on Riverdale. Um, it, so it was a nurse, the nursing home over yep. there. And I've, I'm have redeveloping that into 13 apartments. May put a little dog park in the back. Um, I've got a few other developments on High Street that I've done and already redeveloped. Um, have some small multifamily. Um, but most, I'm not doing single family construction like you. So everything I'm doing right now is, is mainly small to medium sized apartments. That's so, kind of my So focus. do me a favor, turn your head left and right a little bit. Where's the gray hair? I know, dude. Uh, Let this look easy, homie. I don't know. I think it's coming. Uh, yeah. Sleep deprivation's kicking in, so I'm sure the gray hair comes after that, right? So, so I did a bunch of development, created lots and commercial spaces and all that kind of stuff over over the years. And and I'm just and I apologize, I, Jerry corrected me. I should have let you introduce yourself. But I just got so excited about having developer conversations um, sure. because we get asked these questions all the time, and and maybe maybe uh, somebody other than myself can can answer them. So I'm, I'll do I'm my excited best. about them. I mean, and and you know, I found this out before the show started. Got his license when he was 18. I'll That's put right. his put himself through college. Um, selling real estate as an 18 year old. Um, mm -hmm. Now a broker. Hustler. That's amazing. I know, right? Yeah. That's immediately what came to mind, Scott. Yeah. Is hustler. I mean, let's go down that road. That's correct. Someone who's making uh, stuff happen, Scott Morris. 
Yeah, uh, let's ask him about it. I mean, that's uh, at 18, I was in the Marine Corps, uh, you know, just being a hardhead. So that's that, that is that, uh, that, that, that's, 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 that hasn't changed. That hasn't changed. Yeah, I'm now I'm just not in the Marine Corps anymore. <laughs> um, what is it about real estate you like, Gary Palmer? Every home and every every deal is different. Every person's different. Um, it's it's interesting. It keeps me excited. You know, I could never work a job eight to five in an office oh, doing amen. the same thing over and over. It was never me. Um, I knew from early on that I could never work for anybody either. So I knew, you know, my it was my destiny to work for myself from a pretty early age. I feel the same way. So I think talk all about that. I, I, talk about how that feels. I I come from that too. I got out of the core. And, and never worked for anybody but myself. But explain that. Talk, talk about how your day goes. Well, it's, you know, there's, there's pros and cons. You know, I don't have a boss over my shoulder telling me to check in at 8 and do sure. this and do that. So you have to be self-motivated. So I think keeping the focus on getting up at 8 and doing the things and, and, you know, the prioritization of, you know, for me as a broker, developer, investor, you know, every week, day is, is an adventure as far as what, are, what is the focus, what's the priority. Because, you know, there's always people kicking and screaming, right? You're, you know, Keith, I mean, you know, in real estate, when you've got a lot of transactions going, um, you have to focus on, you know, what's most important. And you still got a family and you got to balance your life. So I find that being the, the everyday challenge that keeps, keeps life fun. Well, congratulations. I, I, we've only known each other for a few minutes. I can tell that you're doing it. You're doing a great job. Doing so. what I can. This guy's fantastic. We've got uh, questions already coming in for Scott and Gary, and we'll get to those questions. First, we'll identify some of the people that are watching. we got the homie Scott Williams. Oh, Give yeah. him some props. Love you, Scott Williams. Uh, Catherine Strickland, watching the program, says hello to everybody that's watching the show. Um, live on every social platform possible, your wife watching, Molly Morgan watching, Dale Jones watching, Nick Hill watching, Culpepper, Madison, Lynchburg, Southwestern Virginia, Richmond, Short Pump, Charlotte, North Carolina, Raleigh, North Carolina, all on the feed as we speak. All right, gentlemen, let's talk markets. Pal's got a meeting today. We anticipate some chatter on rake heights again. Um, Scott will get you first. GP will get you following Scott. Um, one month close to being down in 2022. Um, the common denominator has been inventory shortage. Not I mean, going away. Not going away anytime soon. So how do we navigate this market? We'll go from the, the broker's perspective and then we'll talk agents here, and then we got a case study we want to get to as well from a viewer from yesterday's show. Scott Morris, anywhere you want to go. So I'm uh, just shocked again to say, uh, to see so much green on the screen. Like, I, I think if the talk is going to be, let's, you know, rate hikes and faster rate hikes and taking uh, some of this QM and uh, off the table, like, uh, is are they expecting something uh, more dovish coming out to see everything that I'm seeing in front of me over there. Um, that's, I don't know. Uh, I would expect like either no movement or, you know, not that. We'll see. Uh, we'll get Gary Palmer's perspective here in a matter of moments. Like we usually have on Wednesdays, multiple mortgage um, brokers, officers watching the program now will acknowledge Emily and Coulter watching of Atlantic Bay Mortgage. Um, hey. Questions coming in already for Scott Morris like they normally do on Wednesday. Um, all right, GP, jump in here. Um, what have you seen so far? Inventory shortage, rate hikes, the demand is still there. We just have no rooftops on the market right now. So I thought last year rates were, were gonna hike up. I thought the Fed had to, to kind of hedge against inflation. So I'm surprised that rates are still where they are. Um, you know, I. I I don't know, Scott, you, you're the expert, you're in this field. I mean, you tell me, we've got, Keith brought these uh, crystal balls here. And uh, a wand. You know, you so I, I, I was wrong last year. I mean, I, I, I really was. I, I really thought early after COVID, I really thought rates were going to go up. And, and they really didn't. By yeah. and large, they didn't. They didn't impact the market. Um, you know, we're 2022. I think it's interesting. I, I, I can say that I tell my clients, you know, don't let interest rates, you know, dictate whether you buy or not because there's, there's, there's a lot of other factors that go into buying right now. I literally now. had that conversation in the parking garage with someone, like, on the way here. And what you say? It's historically cheap money. Even if it goes up half a point, who cares? This is historically cheap money. You're renting for $1,600 a month, and you're worried about the future. What do you think with more people coming into the uh, – of age that need to be living somewhere – 
do you see your rental cost increasing year over year? It's $1,600 now. You're worried about an $1,800 mortgage when in three years you're going to be paying $1,800 for rent. 23.5 million millennials about ready. About to jump in. About to jump in. That's, the, that's a lot. That's a bigger number than my, the right. boomer generation. And looking to buy. We're talking about oh, yeah. that's to almost 10% of American population. And really, that's not a realistic stat. Or having a lot to of our rent. kids that can't buy. Or homes. having to rent. Yeah. And where are the rooftops for that? I mean, Gary's putting He's ahead of the game with the apartments. But, uh, you know, millions of people, bro. Yeah, millions of people. Judah Wickhauer, you got a message for us on the panel? Let us know if you do. Um, we'll go over the case study that came up yesterday on the show. So, friend of the program, loyal viewer, Jamie Turner, mayor of Gordonsville. Okay. Jamie. This guy just got uh, bought a massive house in Culpeper. Okay. Um, he is renting his townhome in Orange County. Get ready for this. 1,998 square feet, two bedrooms. Mm -hmm. Two bathrooms, Orange County. Mm -hmm. How much rent do you think he's asking a month? I can't jam in because I yeah, know. you know, you know because I was here. Yeah, fifteen hundred. Okay, my number you guys that. obviously are in the business. Sixteen hundred bucks. Okay, sixteen hundred bucks. It, but that's bidding, an art. bidding more that's an art. for sixteen hundred dollars. People fighting tooth and nail uh, to rent this place in Orange County. Sixteen hundred, two bedroom, two bath. Three bedroom, two baths. And, and jump in if I'm wrong. Three bedrooms, two baths, rental in the Charlottesville, Albemarle, Urban Ring. It's got a two in front of it. Yeah, normally. Yeah, so 2,000 and up. So this is Fredericksburg, single family, three bedroom, uh, two bath, uh, $1,600. So a little more, more rooftops, a little, little, little less expensive. Richmond's kind of similar as well. But, uh, I mean, that's not going to last forever. Plus, they're going up, right? They're That's projected this yeah. year to go up 7.1% in 2022. I think they're going to go up a little higher than that by, by the tail of the end of the year. So, um, look, we, we, what happened, what Jerry led us into this is this, this conversation we had before was, you know, a three-bedroom, two baths. They're renting somewhere between 16. This was my text, by the way, <laughs> to, to, to him at 530 in the morning. You know, 16 to 2,400 square feet. So let's take a typical buyer. We're looking at the buy side, right? Not necessarily the rent side. So it's assuming they're qualified, income qualified, assuming they have a 625 to 650 credit, assuming they have enough cash, 3% down payment, right? We're three and a half. It's over that. There's going to be FHA. So the three and a half down and 3% closing costs, six and a half total. So roughly six, six, six percent. They got like five grand worth of credit card, a little bit of student debt, yada, 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 down the road. Like, right, we're, we're, we have a client, right? That's our client. Mm -hmm. We pick up the phone or we send the text and say, how much house can they buy? And that number somewhere, I, I rounded up his numbers a little bit, somewhere around 275 to 325, because I'm going to lean a little pressure on him. Well, come on, you can okay. do it, you can yeah. do it. I'm not top of it. So the question was, is where, where, did, where are they going to go? Right? Mm. And I ran those numbers, and it's not pretty. So um, and we talk about all the time about, you know, this rubber band going out. Normally, I look at Charlesville, Albemarle, Nelson, Green, Fulvan, and Louisa. I actually added Buckingham, because we've been talking about this for quite some time. I added the other side of the mountain and all that stuff. And meeting those criteria, three bedrooms, two baths, there is only 34 homes available. What do you, what do you think, Gary? Jump in here on this. It's pretty crazy. Um, you know, I think we've reached a time where central, not just Albemarle, Charlottesville, but, but central Virginia is just, it's, you know, affordable housing is, is gone. I mean, it just is what it is, you know. I don't, I don't really, I don't see any near-term uh, solutions yeah. to this. I think builders are doing what they can, but they can only move so fast. Well, I'm rather vocal about this. Um, I think green tape needs to be created out of red tape. In other words, red tape needs to be turned into the green tape. And it sounds like you're working in the Charlottesville market, right, quite yes. a bit. So I'm going to just throw this out there. How do you feel about the new, the new let's see how we go. You're going to get me in trouble. No, no, no. That is a very common phrase on this show. Yeah, that is a very common phrase on this show. And it's usually, it's usually me, brother. And, and this lives on the internet forever. And your so, peers and seven brokerages are watching the program right now. Okay. And Jamie Turner, who we're talking about his rental right now, literally said, I signed a 12-month lease moments ago. Get this, we talked about this literally before the show. A travel nurse with a 12-month contract at UVA. Yeah. 
Not sure why they did not look in Charlottesville, but she's our new tenant. Awesome. Jamie Turner, the property we're talking about here. So we should go uh, travel nurses and the value there because we were talking about that. But first, how about getting Gary Palmer into trouble here with a lot of people watching? Oh, man. Well, I'll just, I won't get into too much here, but um, just make it simple. So the, the, the most recent project. We're uh, Marines, so that's good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it break it down. Good. I was hoping to start construction uh, January of uh, 2021. Um, I just started, really started construction, aside from some demo, uh, about four weeks ago. Yeah. So literally 12 months uh, longer uh, than, than my initial projection. There was some red tape. Um, you know, I, I don't know if it was all the city's fault, but I think with COVID too, the city is, is just naturally moving a little bit, you know, slower with building permits, especially when it's a little more complicated and it's a commercial property and a redevelopment. Um, so it caught me, I mean, I'm kind of a newbie, you know, Keith, I, I'm, you know, I've done a few projects, but this is probably my largest project, um, you know, as far as my career goes. So congratulations. I, I, man. Yeah. And I was told by I have my own mentors, coaches, sure. consultants that I that I, sure. you know, and they all told me, you know, you had six to 12 months to whatever you think, because <laughs> if you're dealing with, you know, it's the city of like Charlottesville and Albemarle County. You better you, you better add that into your projections. It's kind of like when you want to renovate something. If you think it's going to cost you a dollar, it's really going to cost you two. Right. It's yeah. always going to cost you double. Um, so this is not new, right? I chair the Piedmont Community House uh, Land Trust, and we developed a bunch of projects and built some units on Nassau Street. It received the money from the city, by the way. It took a year and a half to get the permits, the building permits. Yeah. A year and a half. So where I was trying to get you into a little bit of trouble is um, the city just adopted this missing middle in the, in the comp plan. It's about ready to go into the zoning side of things. You're a developer. You're in the space. Um, is that going to help? Is, is that something that, that is interesting to you as a developer and builder? So articulate that again. You said so, <clears throat> so what the, the city has um, went through this um, uh, future land use plan, and they're mm -hmm. saying and assuming the zoning gets adopted, they're saying that on the single family detached lots, you can put multiple. They're trying units. to increase density. Create density, right? Yeah. So yeah. if they approve the zoning for that, is that something of interest to you? Or well, do you I think, think it's it of helps? interest to everybody in Charlottesville. I mean, we need more density. Um, you know, I haven't looked at the comp plan recently. Um, I, I did a few months ago. Um, you know, I saw that there were, like, I think the accessory dwelling unit um, trying to increase density in, in some of the areas in the city will help. I mean, I think we need a lot more than that, though, to really solve this, this crisis that we, that we have. But it does help me. Yeah, as a developer, I think any time you, you can increase density, it, it gives developers the ability to go out and, and, and be more aggressive. Um, as you know, Keith, I mean, that's, that's a key metric. And, any developer's uh, handbook is, is density. You know, I mean, what's the density? Um, if it's increased, a lot of times you can pay more. Um, you can, you know, and create more opportunities for people in Charlottesville and Albemarle. Scott, jump in here. What do you think? Uh, no, I mean, that's the, isn't that the key? I mean, that's kind of, uh, Gary broke that down pretty well. Um, and as far as how that's going to help, um, it really also has to do, how do we turn red tape into green tape to, get people like Gary um, better facilitated to shorten those those runs from from to, from start of plan to actually start a project Does that absolutely I mean you know if I started in 2021 those apartments will be built and rented out to people right now um, and I'd be on to my next project but I'm not well, folks are asking would you do another project in the city of Charlottesville and Albro County again after going through this well let me finish this one okay, <laughs> okay. so the jury still <laughs> I probably would yes yeah. I mean the, the, the answer is yes I, I would um, but I, I would certainly you know my, my again and this this hurts the market but if I'm looking at the next building or the next development project I, I've got to factor in increased cost for red tape um, so that's gonna make me less competitive and you know, but I have to, you know. Can There's I? another good question. Um, and Johnny Ornalis, welcome to the program. So live on 15 Facebook pages, and the pages are hopping right now. Um, Gary, how has your footprint expanded with showings and or client um, dynamics in this market with Charlottesville and Amor County having such limited inventory? Well, you know, Ashley and myself, you know, we're a small boutique firm, and, and we've, you know, done a good job of, kind of our outreach. So we've got a fair share of buyers. I mean, I just preach patience, 
uh, Jerry, in this market to, to our buyers. It, they just have to be. Um, I mean, we're still finding buyers' homes. Uh, the negotiations are still tough, um, but we're making it work. Um, I know Keith's in the business too. Uh, I think he'd probably say something. You know, just, just you got to stay the course. Uh, I tell my buyers, hey, look, don't get discouraged if the first three homes you write offers on, you know, they don't, don't get, get accepted. accepted. Don't, don't throw in the towel. Just keep going. And if or you do, or I've seen, you know, there's been a lot of emotion with rate change, and I try to reach out to everybody that I've got pre-approved. That way, if they were shopping at the tippy tippy top of where they were, we're not having to have a new conversation if they go to make an offer on something that they might not qualify for because it's got an increased HOA on top of uh, increased rates. So it, it's really, uh, it's you know, like anything else, it's it's everything we do. It's about convenience and managing expectations. So our are you preparing them for the best mental, you know, place that they can be when they go through this? That's just sizzle reel right there. Mark that timestamp right there for Scott. Well said, Scott Morris Thanks, of man. Ross Mortgage. Um, we'll cut that post show. Um, Keith Smith. So, so are you, are you seeing folks that you're speaking with, and that? And I was asked this question yesterday, so I, I wanted to ask you to this to today. Um, if the and, and if interest rates go up a slight quarter point, eighth point. Are you seeing them jumping out or they're just absorbing that and moving forward? In other words, are you seeing deals falling apart over that? I'm not seeing deals falling yeah. apart over that. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, what, what I'm watching today looks good. I'm like waiting for pricing to come yeah, out. I'm like yeah, super yeah. So let's not look over there. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's okay, going to okay. change five minutes from now. <laughs> but anyways. No, yeah. but this is good. Yeah, yeah. yeah this yeah. is. This is. This is very yeah. good. For once. Um, for once, but, yeah, but the, for in the last 30 days. The point I'm trying to get out for us practitioners in the field, right, on the, on the end of it and for other real estate agents and practitioners that are watching, you, your conversation's a little bit more in-depth, right? You're explaining things a little bit more. Communicate you're, you're at a high level. A high level, but you're not, people are not jumping out. No, people aren't jumping out. That's an important piece of information, I think, to get out. It might be people are a little people bit. People are getting their feelings hurt. But they're not jumping out, and if they're if they're being communicated with well with, then they understand. Like, look, um, you are not bringing cash to the table. Let's look, and if they go, well, what does that even mean? Like, then you can't go in and pay all the money in one lump sum for this property. You are going to be up against that. You can't waive your the appraisal um, because the bank's going to require it. These are things that you have to have in order to execute this transaction. And as long as you are, as long as they're being educated that when they're up against eight other offers, um, look, we're going to find you a property where that's not the case, but you can't lose your motivation to keep going after them. And then, you know, six months down the road, be like, oh my gosh, I've spent almost another $20,000 in rent to my landlord. Like your focus needs to be on finding the property that you can be happiest with and pull the trigger on. Gary, I hope Mark that one, J-Dubs. That timestamp. Go ahead, Keith Smith. And hopefully you can answer this because I was asked this question the other day. Is now the right time to buy? What do you think? I think it is. I mean, historically, I mean, in 2000 and I guess it was 2000. Gosh, my brain. I'm getting, I'm getting a little bit older. 2006. When I bought my first property, rates were 7.5%. Yeah, mine and, was 6 and an eighth in my first. And I was told that I was young. I was I was in my low 20s at the time. And I, everyone was telling me rates were good. Good for you, bro. And I was like, it's 7.5%, you know, for an investment loan. For just a rental property, and I was jumping all over. Yeah, dude, right I left and right. I was, jumping jacks. I was on a mission to buy everything I could because rates were so low at seven and a half percent. So, oh. you know, for me, it, everything's relative. So, if rates go up to four, it, I mean, you know, the, the key is if if you're buying in this market right now, I think you know you tell your buyers, look, if you're if you're only going to live here right now for one or two years, you may want to hit the pause button. And think about buying, right? But if you're going to be here for more than five years, especially more than five, you know, if your rates go up a little bit, as long as you have the cash flow, and, and what I mean by that is if your debt service, if the, the rental income of the property exceeds your, your debt service and your operating costs, it's a pretty safe buy because you can always convert it to an investment and then you've got free cash flow coming after. Because the market, I mean, we're in peak market. I mean, there's no doubt. The last real estate correction was in 2007, 8, and I know a lot of, uh, a lot of different sources are saying that the real estate market is going to hum for another five to six years. Um, I, I don't know if I, if I buy that. Um, I think no, the real estate market that. might cool down. Well, I think there's two things. Well, the foreclosures are starting to, to come out now, right? I'm getting some of those calls, I guess, the forbearance. From investors? Uh, yeah, from an investor perspective, people who are, you know, 
there was a forbearance last year. I think they put it in in July. Mm -hmm. So now banks are starting to talk to these these people who haven't paid their mortgage in a couple of years, and they're saying, "Look, it's time to pay." Well, some people are. Some people are reworking that and out. They're giving some very enticing plans to play to people who don't even need to requalify, which originally was what they were going to do. But I've had people who have reached out to me, and I was like, "There's no way that I can refinance you out of this." And they're saying, "Hey, look, uh, this my servicer reached out, and they're saying that they're not even going to requalify me as long as I start making payments at this new rate on this new contract on this new date." Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is so that good for the market, though? Well, it's it's preventing. Where are these? You know, it, that's a really complicated question. Um, we're not un, we're not leaving all these people without homes who aren't going to credit qualify to get into a rental if they're you know actually willing to do the work. I mean, I think the human cost is much greater than when we talk about the market cost in that aspect. Well said. Well said. Um, devil's advocate for the sake of a talk show. I 100% agree with you on the human cost standpoint. Um, from a market dynamic standpoint, it's taking inventory that otherwise should sure. have been on the market yeah, yeah. and removing it from the market. I like that perspective too. You are a capitalist. But. Okay, I, but I understand the human cost. And, and give me this perspective. You're the expert. I'm going to learn from you here. What is it doing to the loan cycle? Did it just in significantly increase the loan cycle, meaning the purchaser, the owner of the home is staying in the home even longer, which means years from now that home is going to not really come on the market for an extended period of time? It's worse than that. They're throwing 40-year mortgages at them. Yeah. Okay. So think about what a 40-year mortgage could do to, to a market mm -hmm. dynamics there. So let's, think, let's press pause and think about that for a second. So are we saying that these people who went through this incredibly difficult time and were offered uh, a parachute out are, are going to be in those homes forever? Or are we saying that, let's say that they, they make life changes that either one or two things is going to happen. They're not going to continue to pay these people and they are going to get evicted. Or they are going to go through the same life experiences as your normal purchase uh, seller buyer does. And three to five years from now when they've got their, their house in order, they're going to turn around and sell the property and they're going to repay or they're going to end up refinancing because they're going to be in a position credit wise to do that at that point. I don't think this is a 40, I don't think this is like ringing the bell and like now these people are here forever. They, dude, it's, they're going to go through life just like they, they were going I through life before. I think from an investor's perspective, there's opportunity without a doubt. This is this forbearance and foreclosure. I, I went through the great time of unpleasantness. So I understand what foreclosures volumes mean. All it's going to do, and I just read a great article in Inman about it, um, all it's going to do is increase the inventory a little bit. Right. The volume of potential yeah. foreclosures are minuscule. Yeah. At one point in time, it was 10, 20, 30 percent. It was huge numbers of, of, the, of the market. I also think that prevents the limbing effect. And what the I what? Mean, the limbing effect. Yeah. And what I mean by that is, let's say all they pushed all these, they started pushing all these people out. All right. And then there were people who could pay but choose not to pay and say, well, I can walk away too. And that's where a problem, I think, but where begins they're gonna go, to be right? created. So sure. that, that's, that's, I think that's the human factor that you were talking about. But I think as far as... Scott Moore showing some empathy over here on the show today. I'm, I'm a nice guy. Uh, you are a nice guy, Scott Moore. <laughs> but market impact and changing this 34 to 120, it's not going to impact the market that much because what what is happening and, I, and i'm working with some folks like this what's happening these services are giving them this hey you start your payments down we'll tack it on the back end and we'll do it a 40 year and and they'll kick the proverbial can down the road we this may come back and bite us on the butt after your five years i don't disagree with that but i think in the short term I don't think it's going it, to, it may help the inventory a little bit, definitely help the investor component. Yeah, on I, it. I don't see a 2007, 2008, anything like that. I just maybe see a little bit of a cool down. Um, even though inventory levels are still going to be low, I think if interest rates do go up, um, and, you know, Scott, I, I don't know what you're thinking. Do you have a projection for where it's going? What's the median interest rate going to be? I mean, be the people who actually who, who are, who get paid the big money, they're wrong all the time, so I can say whatever I want. <laughs> That's, there you go. <laughs> You're gonna, you have a prediction? Um, uh, so 
I said that rates were going to go higher faster than, and, I st and I'm sticking to this, um, de depending on what happens now, you know, if something happens with Russia and everybody dives back into U.S. bonds and then rates come back down, I mean, that's not an ideal reason for it to happen, but it's a, certainly a, a, a piece that's on the table. Um, I think if we actually have to hedge inflation and the government steps up and they increase rates higher than what they have previously forecasted, meaning uh, making 50-bit moves instead of 25 and making more of them in the cycle than they've talked about. Um, we're Overall, if that keeps bond purchases to continue to slow, we are going to see rates increase faster than what they forecasted. But, and look, to what? What do you 8%? think? I said five percent. I say five percent. Okay, so cheap well, money. If they go to five percent, then that's this is the scenario that I, it'll cool things down a little bit. I think. I mean, borrowing power at five percent. But if we still got twenty-three million people that have to find a place to live, so, where do they go? And, and on top of that, I'll add that Gary, you jump in. That's, UBA, this is more devil's advocate than anything. Yeah, I'll for sure, devil's yeah. advocate for a sake of the talk show. UBA said they're going to hire more people than ever. Mm -hmm. um, we have multiple employers bringing in people from out of market right. into this market and setting up headquarters in Charlottesville to poach yep. the UBA talent. Mm -hmm. So new buyers and twenty and a ton of millennials jumping into the mix. Yeah. So the Q3 report, the car. Q3 report from 2021 to 2020 showed the median sale price in Charlottesville actually went down 2%. So from, so I, again, I'm not saying that's an indicator of what I'm trying to say here, but Albemarle was up 2%. If you look at the surrounding counties, I think Fluvanna was up something crazy like 17%. Um, Green was up pretty big too, 15%. Orange was up. Nelson. Orange and Nelson were up. Yeah. But if you look at Albemarle and Charlottesville on the Q3 report, Okay, the median sell price pretty much is already flat over from from twenty from twenty from Q, into Q three twenty twenty one to to so I mean if rates continue to rise I don't think the foreclosure that's not going to be a big factor in all this as Keith is, is right I think they were saying one point five million and, to and two which is nothing yeah, relative to, yeah. to what's going to at one point at one point in time I believe it was like ten million. Yeah. That, that were on, on foreclosure. Yeah. It, was a, it was a huge So this number. is nothing, really. We're adding a little context to him, and then, Keith, you jump in the mix. While Q3 was, we'll call it flat, to put it to context, Q1, Q2, and Q4, on the flip side, were extremely high from, from values upticking in those jurisdictions that you're mentioning. In fact, he put some numbers out on the show yesterday. And Monday. Uh, and Monday. Um, Almoral County, was it Monday? 37 active listings. Median, um, a medium asking price of 375k, Admiral County. Um, so at a at a certain age, you can't remember 48 hours ago. <laughs> so that's the age I'm at. But the, but the bottom line is is the, the cars is a lagging in the right right. It's so sure. it's so lagging. So what we're doing on Mondays, and I would encourage you to watch, is we're doing I'm doing year over year comparisons. Right, the snapshot last 30 days, last three weeks. So what's happening here is is the prices are going up in the last 30 days. Inventory is just taking a a, a plummet, mm -hmm. and um, so uh, you know. It's, this is all a great conversation. Um, uh, I was, as you guys were talking rates, um, uh, uh, Gary, I, I, I tend to have, um, I tend to make bets on the show and I lose them all. And I'm glad. <laughs> he's not won one yet. I'm glad to lose. I think lose. he's over 4 I'm, And I'm glad to lose them. Um, my bet is we won't exceed four by, by the end of this year. So anybody on here want to take that bet for a bottle of booze? Over, under? Scott, that's up your alley this, right there. Yeah, this, I'll, sure, I'll take it. I've, I've gotten, yeah, I'm a I'm little on. bottle, just I'm a little, little bottle. bottle. Okay, okay, <laughs> so the over under is 4%. 4% 4 flat. is a push. You're saying it will stay below 4% on will. December 31, 2022. I think it will. And, and we'll, he's saying they uptick above 4%. I'm saying it's over 4 And we'll bring you back and see who wins, and I'll bring a bottle, <laughs> a, a bottle, a, a bottle of booze. What do you think? Uh, I'm going to go just slightly over 4, yeah. 4 and a quarter. So the last time we were north of that was in 19. We were four and a half, depending on where you were, four, nine, five, five o'clock, um, five percent, excuse me. How was your business in 19? Good. Pre pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good. So I don't think interest rates are going to have a huge impact. But I come from a really, and Jerry, because I've said this a thousand times, I come from a different perspective. Yeah, My, I mean, his first house, 18 plus percent interest rate. I mean, his first place, you, you said seven? Seven and a half. Mine, six, six plus. Yeah. But along with that, um, when we 
let's so let's not forget inflation and average wage growth and all the other pieces of that puzzle. Um, well, that's kind of what I was going to get it's into. It's all uh, it's all a, you know. I don't want to call it a shell game, but uh, we're we're pl we're pricing an affordability. If if that was because people could afford to pay that interest based on other mitigating factors uh, in the economy in their lives, and uh, now rates are low, which allows for pricing to be high. Sure. Um, you got to take that into account. So, so my, my, I'm basing my bet on inflation stabilizing. If it doesn't, then I've lost. What do you mean by unstable? What do you what and lost? He, he's oh, he's bet. basing oh, okay. his bet on the supply chain issues fixing and working themselves out, the labor shortages fixing and working themselves out. We're already seeing some of the supply chain issues fixed. Well, our and percentage worked out. inflation is the highest it's been in, since the '80s. So what I'm saying is I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that gets under control and walks itself back a little bit. If it doesn't, then rates will obviously go over four. Um, let's acknowledge some of the viewers coming in, and then we have to acknowledge the phenomenon that's been put on the fiend from the PEP, repping the PEP over here. All right, um, two all right. people repping the PEP. Um, first, we're going to acknowledge uh, your wife is so proud of you, Gary Palmer. <laughs> She's putting that in the feed right now. Actually, we, we, uh, we respect the uh, support of Better Half right there. I have one at home as well. Molly Morgan, Deborah Hairston, and Keith Jones. Hello. Four states on our heat map watching this program here. North Carolina, Maryland, Tennessee, and Virginia. Welcome to the program. Three of your colleagues in the space on the show right now. We're starting to get the, uh, the ones that watched last week marking it down and new ones coming in, which is good. Um, how about this phenomenon? And Jamie, thank you for adding this to the show here. Um, and I'll read it verbatim because I've experienced this as well. One interesting phenomenon we saw with applicants for our town home rental, the property, they, they are looking to buy a property, but they keep losing out on houses and their current landlords will not do month to month or short term leases for them. So they're stuck in this scenario where they have to renew on one year leases, which is keeping them from getting in the housing market game. He said 20% of the applicants that were looking to rent our townhome are a demographic like this. And I've seen that as well. So 90 days, maybe before their lease is up, they give notice to the landlord. They think 90 days is ample time to potential, potentially purchase the, the first time home. Not they, they quickly realize that is not the case. 90 days then turns into 45 days, then turns into 30 days. Then they're clawing or begging the landlord back, please, please, dear God, let me keep this space so we don't have to move out of it and do all that hubaloo, whatever the word is. And then the landlord, guess what they have? Some freaking leverage. And then that 3.75%, 3 4.75% increase turns into 8, 9% increase, and they call it the cost of doing business. Anywhere you guys want to go on this topic. You've Does I'll ask a question. Ooh. So I think Good part of it might have to do. Well, I'm asking Gary the question. He's going to be. Able to. <laughs> I think <laughs> part of that is probably a pain point more so with the time of year. Um, there's a lot of landlords may not want to deal with having to replace the tenant in winter. If this was going maybe month to month, April, May, June. Um, that could prob maybe afford you some more leverage for those that are going through it. Somebody who has some tenants, is that? Some on both sides. I'm, I'm a landlord, I have tenants, um, and I work with a lot of buyers. I mean, I haven't found that to be too much of an issue. But what I tell my buyers, look, go to your landlord six months in advance. Yeah. Tell them you're getting into the market. Don't wait two to three months before you want to buy a home in this market. And, and have a conversation. See what your options are. I mean, what I've found is if, if they go to their landlord and they say, look, you know, we're going to get in the market. Um, we don't know where that's going to go. But if we find another tenant to replace our lease, are you okay with letting us out when we find it? And most landlords are okay with that as long as they don't lose money. I don't care. I mean, if, if, my, if my tenant comes to me and says, you know, look, you know, I'm going to buy a house. If I find a tenant at the same rent or the new rent, and, I, and I, there's no loss of income to you, do you care? I don't care. Not at all, as, you know? long, as, long and, as, as long as I'm your realtor. That's yeah, well, that's about to say, that's about, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have no problem with that if I help you with it. Yeah. But, but you, 
<laughs> but but you I beat mean, me to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not always that simple. I mean, but I've found that... It was a softball. He tells we're just having fun, Gary. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're just having fun. Six but, months in advance, though, is the key. But what you're saying is impactful, right? Um, people are sometimes afraid to talk to you, right? Because you're the landlord. Back to this emotional... People are afraid of everything, bro. ...of component. If you're ready to do it, talk to him. The, the market is, in, is such a, hey, no problem, we can get you out. You know, you might have a, a deposit issue or something mm -hmm. like that. But it's not going to be, hey, you got to give me a check for six months. Not a problem. By the way, hey, I got three guys or three people behind ready, ready to come in. Well, have the conversation. It's so easy to find renters, especially if you're in Charlottesville, Albemarle, that most of the... And evidently Orange are, County. Yeah, and Orange <laughs> County now, too. So... It's not really what I've found with most of my buyers, they've had no issue finding another tenant. If this was 2008, 2009, 2010, that may have been a different conversation. Sure, but right? this is even, let's, I, I, I want to talk about that. So we've talked about this the great unpleasantness, our blessed area. Even when we went through that, Dude, we were not Las Vegas. There, we weren't. Look, yeah, you didn't drive right. into like, oh my god, it's just this is an entire part of the city. No one lives in anymore. Like people, you know, it looked very normal here. There was a lot of signs. There was a lot of signs in front of houses, but it wasn't like this mass ex exodus. R real estate. We learned this from Lisa Sturrivant, who's the our associations, uh, Virginia associations lead economic. Um, uh, advisor, um, you know, we're second in GDP in the state. So when this all happened, it, it affected everybody. But it really didn't deeply affect, but just a few pool of people. Yours truly would be one of them. On 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 the end of it, um, and what I wanted to pivot a little bit. I have a 15-year running spreadsheet of our sales and actives and pendings and all this stuff. To me, this where we are right now and today in the market, it feels more normal. Right, it feels more normal about people are not quite put ready to put houses on the market because it's after Christmas. We got snow. Does it feel that way to you, in, in your opinion, or does I'd it feel different? That. COVID really changed the cycle sure. um, in 2020, and I feel like now your sellers are hey, let's let's go to market in March and April, and basically before 2020, those conversations are sounding more more normal. Yeah, so the conversations we're having is call interstate service company, have them come in, and, and let's let's paint, let's do a little bit of work on the kitchen, let's, fill in, let's work on this and this great time and put it on there. The conversation we're having, and I'm sure you're having them too, is, well, the house is ready, now let's do this now, because there's a lack of inventory. Are you having those conversations yeah, too? Yeah, and it, it's house specific, you know, as to what makes the most sense, I think. What about the buyers that are the sellers that are saying, "Where am, where am I going to go next?" Great. How are you navigating that? Great question. Well, there's a couple couple options there. I mean, are, you, are they moving out of market? Are they staying in market and trading up? I mean, the the money that they're making on the sale of their home is it being eroded by the top dollar they're paying for the next? It depends on where they're buying and if they're if they're going up or down, right? Um, but I mean, there's there's options. I mean, some sellers are you know short term. They're doing some short term rental and just just knowing that it could be a grind to find the next. I was home. I was going to touch on that. So some of the things I'm seeing is people that are selling, getting into a short term rental either while waiting on new construction or while wait or while waiting to purchase that next home. That inventory to pick up. Which which does um, eat away you know minimum you know depending on how much they made or what they executed those funds. Do they pay off a lot of debt? Um, are they using it for a down payment? What are their you know their goals? So some of that money is you know getting washed in that process. But at the same time it. It all depends on the individual and what their situation is. It depends is. on where they are in their life and their buyer yeah. profile, right? I, I'm, I'm an empty nester. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I, unless I'm ready to move into something, I'm not moving into something, moving my stuff twice and then moving it back in there. It's not a fiscal right. thing. It's just a well, grumpy old man thing. If you're, an, you know, if you're, selling, if you're selling a $600,000 house. Thank you for showing up, Scott. Thank you for showing up. You know, then you're going to be better off. You got meat on the bone. Yeah, even if you have to absorb yeah. some of those those short term costs, you're still probably better off. So, putting your real real estate broker, real estate agent hat on, what other tools do you have in your tool chest to help that question that that Jerry asked? And you can't say move to Southwestern Virginia because we have uh, Pamela Freeman saying go Gary for Pulaski, Virginia right oh, wow. now, giving you some props right now. You got cool. five states on the show as we speak wow. here. So what's the tool? What's the answer to the key question for you, GP? There is no one tool. Yeah, um, I, I think Keith knows that. Uh, it, that's there's 
it really is specific to the house and i'm not deflecting maybe i am a little bit but there really is no um, trick to this um, every person's situation is unique uh, their equity position in their home is different from the next sellers the market that they're moving are they going up are they going down are they going to be in albemarle green like where are they going um you have to play all that in and i'm not Again, they've got cop out, but it's a little more complicated. But it's not a cop out. You're right on the you, right out. You have to sit down with your client, and you have to go through, you know, ten to fifteen, you know, I'll call them variables associated with selling the home and buying, and you have to make a decision based on those things. It's not one criteria or one thing. There's High level many, communication. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so I've said this once. I'll say it a million times on on the show. This iPhone I'm holding in my hand is not going to do that, right? Right, the, the the you know it might be a great place to find a home or do it, but you need Scott, the trusted advisor. You need Gary, the trusted right. advisor. You need Keith and Yona, the trusted advisor. You need Jerry Miller, the trusted advisor, to help navigate that because it's just not one thing. This is not like getting on what's the what's the travel thing, right? Orbit. Or there you go, and yeah. booking a flight. Right. This is multiple things because yeah. one thing never affects one thing. It always affects. Many other yeah. different so, things. I mean, and part of that, well, people go there to start a search, and then a hum they go to a human that they trust is going to care for them during the process. Like, um, that's that my, my trust of humans is always going to be greater than the trust of, uh, An algorithm. The, of the internet. Yeah, well said. <laughs> Thank you very much for saying that. Um, this question's come in from Buster Fox. Back to back shows. He's All right, what up, Buster? On this program, Buster Fox, we love you here. Um, I'm going to paraphrase Buster your comment, um, and he wants to know the perspective on 1031 exchanges, investors, and if it's cannibalizing any inventory from first time home buyers. He said, "I've had two of these hit this year already. Thoughts on 1031s being an issue for first time home buyers and potentially driving bidding wars for properties." Um, we'll put a we'll put a, a little ribbon in Laban's terms around 1031s for viewers and listeners um, to minimize some capital gains exposure. You can sell an investment property and then roll the gains into another property, um, but you have to do it in a very short time window. You have to identify a couple of properties. You can then replace some of those properties you've identified with some other ones if you, if you find some Let's new use ones the word on. like property. Yeah, like and, property. Uh, Absolutely. I don't want to pin down on the the days but it's something like uh is it 90 and 180 you've got yeah 90. i think that's right it's and exactly I'll, 90 yeah. i'll yeah. confirm but um so he the, the topic for the the table are 1031 exchanges impacting first-time buyers in this market that's a great question you want to start with that gary uh, yeah so i've done two 1031s myself um I, they're both have been more in the multifamily arena so i don't um i don't see that being a huge factor for inventory and first-time home buyers. Yeah, I've done, uh, I'd say, four in the last four months, and they've been investors who are going from and into into properties that two of them were, I would not say, suitable for a first-time home buyer. Were they multifamily? Um, uh, no, they were they were regular. They, they were distressed, um, and uh, you know they're you know in the RRR program kind of people and one of them I think and one of them was just talking to a buddy of mine who ended up you know doing it making it a cash deal for the rest of it in executing and that was a clean property um, but it was just something on the a little higher end I don't think none of the, none of the four really checked the box one of them maybe for a first time home buyer the short answer is no the long answer as we say, maybe yes, maybe no, yes. Yeah, maybe yeah, because at the same time, could so come, could some of those been for the right person a two hundred three k where they went in and you know we had six months to you know really put the whole thing so together. We, we have a unique dynamic maybe. happening in the marketplace, right? Which to go to Scott's position, and I agree with you. We're so insulated. We're not Phoenix, right? We're not these large things. But this whole iBuyer thing that, that Zillow's dumping that's coming back in, they're being bought by investors. So there'll be some little 1031s going on in, in that end of it. But from my perspective, the, the, the inventory pool, as I refer to it as the kiddie pool, and the, it's so freaking thin. Even if you take two or three out it, out of 34, it, it's a percentage impact. Right on it. So it will uh, now. Once the dense, once the 
once the inventory starts growing up there, it probably will not have that much. But you know, if I own, if you and I own a rental piece of property, I own a several myself, and I want to sell that and buy something else, I'm going to do 1031 exchange. Right. That's going to take a unit off of the resale market. So it will yeah. impact it slightly, just not in in, a, in an impact impactful way. Sure, but the, I mean, to the question, how does that affect first-time home buyers? Are these properties that are being purchased first-time home buyer properties? That's the kind of. I know the, the ones we bought were okay. at that price point. Cool. So. Um, how about this one, Kevin Higgins? We'll get to your comment. Cully Baggett and Green has got some comments for us that we'll get to. In fact, we'll get to Cully's now. Um, I would think that with the lack of inventory in the market, that it would be driving the new construction market than I'm seeing in the local areas. What's your view on that? I know Charlottesville has a tremendous amount of new construction pertaining to the apartments and townhomes living styles, but I'm speaking more of the lack of new construction in the more rural areas of Central Virginia. So new construction, rural areas of Central Virginia, Cully Baggett and Green. You want to start with that one, Gary Palmer? I mean, it's happening. Uh, I mean, there, you know, new construction's happening. I, I think to what we talked about earlier on the show, it's not at a pace that's going to solve our problem. Um, we talk, I think that's just something we talk about every show. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, I, and I've watched the show sometimes, and I've heard you guys talk about this before. Um, I mean, there's, the builders are out. They're, they're swinging the hammer. It's happening. Um, but the red, you know, again, there's... But those are projects that have been approved. Right, so we get and back that's to the red tape, back to, you know, developers and, and builders trying to, to get the next wave going. Um, that's where I think some of the... the well, the it's not going in the right direction because Green just rejected... A, a, a new subdivision, so did Fulvana County. Yeah. So they're not getting approved. So if they're not getting approved, they're not going to go through site plan, they're not going to get right. built on that stuff. Um, if anything, Waynesboro and the Shenandoah Valley is seeing the uptick Cully in new construction. And I think the inventory shortage that we're seeing in Albemarle and Charlottesville and Central Virginia is driving tremendous tailwinds behind the Shenandoah Valley. Now the question is, are we going to start seeing agents in the car footprint expand their footprint to Shenandoah Valley to accommodate... Um, perhaps a larger pool of rooftops over there that Central Virginia does not have. Um, your better half has this comment, contingencies are important in this market. Um, having a contingency in place for buyers um, that allow them to, excuse me, for sellers and buyers to allow them to find a new home in such low inventory scenarios. That's a good point and Keith's made that point before, having that contingency in place. Anyone I want to shed some light on that? It's one of those tools, you know, and again, there's, there's several things you can do, but certainly, I mean, that's worked well for sellers before you make the, you know, the sell of your home contingent on finding a home and you're protected. You don't have to move. You don't have, now you might hinder your ability to command, you know, market price a little bit with that because, you know, some buyers might not find that appealing, right? But you get that certainty of knowing, look, you know, if, if I don't find a home, I don't have to move. And then it, it also it also kind of impacts who's like you said the buyers are going to look at that well hold it because yeah. we're going to have to put it in the listing. But it does help the let's put, let's make a deal game. So if we've got a buyer who is well qualified, uh, let's say they've got they've got either they've got all the down payment money, but they could use the closing costs, and we've got somebody who's going to sit in the house for thirty, sixty x amount of days. You know, it helps the negotiation to get those deals done. I see seller possession agreements working a lot better than that because it, it allows the seller to close, to receive the, the cash, whatever equity they might mm -hmm. have, and they can move forward. The buyer you know, owns the home, and then they have to just figure out what they're doing for three months or 60 days or 90 Seller days. possession agreement, when the seller sells their home, guys, to a buyer, and then at closing, they strike a deal where the, the buyer cannot move into their house right away, and the seller actually stays in the home longer and pays rent to the new buyer. Um, how many of those have you seen? I've done a few. Um, yeah, it's not uncommon. Kevin Higgins got this comment for the, t for the round table. What do you think the future of civil office buildings will be? Ooh. And can office buildings be the uh, opportunity to increase residential inventory for this market? Now, I mean, you know, so as a developer, I mean, I would love if the city, I mean, the, the question comes down to the zoning and right. can you take an office building kind of like this and convert it easily into multifamily or to condos to create some inventory? And that'd be great because office is, you know, it's slowing down a little bit. And so I think there's an opportunity to add some density um, in Charlottesville, Albemarle, if, if the localities will allow it. Um, but you need cooperation from them 
to allow these conversions to, to take place. But I would definitely be looking at that. And, you know, yeah. I have some, uh, a little bit of insight on this. Interestingly, this building here allows the conversion of the first and second floor to residential if the association will prove it. So if you have association control, yeah. you can pivot, pivot the first and second floor to residential and build micro apartments, should you want. And the water and plumbing is already in place for that conversion. Just throwing that out there. Jeez, I uh, wonder why. <laughs> I, just throwing that out there. Um, and we're gonna have this question. Richmond American has started new development in the town of Orange County. First in a while for its kind for Orange County. Richmond American, new development in Orange County. So we have some new uh, rooftops on the horizon to, in Orange. And dude, um, Gordonsville is on the feed quite a bit here. That area is blowing up. Anybody doing any deals over in Gordonsville, financing any deals in Gordonsville that you're seeing? Yeah, so uh, one of the builders I work with, uh, they've had, they've increased their footprint there. Um, it's, they've been pretty friendly. Um, there's some things, some lending things to keep in mind. Uh, they've got uh, a little, they're, they're limited uh, as far as some of the uh Price points consider compared to surrounding counties as far as uh, what you can finance there, but uh, they've been the builders that I, I work with have been very mindful with that. Why is that? Um, because of area median income. That's so exactly. depending on uh, mm -hmm. the the loan the loan program that they're using or the borrower's cash strength, how that how that would work in getting something done. So it's interesting, Jerry. You were talking about Augusta County and and so looking at this two seventy five to three twenty five attached detached. Uh, what's available. There's 20 available in Augusta County. Not a single one of them is new construction, which is unique. Hmm. Interesting. Louisa County. Augusta's a, a big county, man. Like, you get out into, like, Churchville and some of the, like, the super yeah, rural they're, areas. They're, they're, all, yeah. they're, they're spread all over. But Louisa County, out of 20, um, three-quarters of them are new construction, which is interesting. Stat on that. What do you make of that stat? What do you think? I don't know. That's yeah. interesting. I mean, uh, I... I People are going to Augusta. I mean, you know, even from Charlottesville, it's more affordable. So I would think there's a demand there. I'm surprised some builders haven't gobbled up some land and started building. Part of it is, is there's, there's, there's been in Louisa County, and I know a little bit about this uh, from some of the boards and commissions I sit on. Um, Louisa County's had a bunch of subdivisions approved pre time of great unpleasantness, these are the projects that are now starting to come in. Yeah. So these were projects that, <clears throat> excuse me, that were approved, site plan was done, whatever it was, it sat dormant for a while, now they're getting built and put in. That's, I think that's where that math is on that. So they, so they took a 20 year head start on, or I'm sorry, a 12 year head start on Fluvanna in that aspect as well. Okay, good job Fluvanna, let's go. <laughs> so, so there's a true Fluvanna, and I, he and I have known each other, I don't know if you shared this with, since he was zero, oh, okay. um, and um, had the misfortune and actually operating some equipment for one of these days when I, when I was building a couple of decades ago on that on that end of it. But I'm a Fulvanite, so um, it's, uh, yeah, he's right. We missed out on water and we missed out on this. <laughs> Are you guys um, confident that 2022 will be your best year in business? I believe every year is my best year in business, oh, but that's just my mindset. So, okay. yes, I, I'm going I'm to go out and say it's be my best year. I, I feel similar. I go to you. the plate thinking I'm never going to strike out. So, yeah. Dude, you hit bombs every time. That's right. You're in the box. I like it. Chicks dig the, the long ball, Scott Morris. Keith uh, Smith, are uh, you confident? I love that attitude, and I am uh, an all-in guy. I'll think by the time we have our show next year, I think the math's going to be a little lower than, than next year. And strictly because of inventory? Strictly because of inventory. There's just, um, you know, I, I, I was asked by somebody, um, you must be doing really good. And I said, well, if I can't close a house, I don't get paid. There you go. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. kind of how that, how that goes. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm optimistic about it. I always am. You don't be in the field that we're all in without being all in 110 percent uh, but i think when we crunch the numbers next year you'll find us down a little bit and it's purely a lack of inventory um who is building in louisa liberty homes betha builders who else uh, I've, i'll let you guys talk and i'll, uh, I'll try to jefferson, jefferson, and jefferson home builders um you uh, said jefferson jefferson yeah uh, they, they're in orange they're not in louisa um we said we're, we're talking louisa specifically yeah liberty M MR. MGR development and who are liberty, 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 liberty. It's all liberty. Yeah, that's liberty. mostly what I see. Liberty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Liberty is making moves here. Um, this question specifically for Gary: um, Are you looking at any areas outside of Charlottesville for development investment properties? If so, where? 
I'm not. Um, I'm pretty committed to, to Charlottesville Albemarle. Um, always have been, even when I started buying properties, you know, 15 years ago, I just stayed in Albemarle, Charlottesville. I like the rentability aspects of being, you know, close to UVA. Um, I think if the market ever does shift and shifts a little bit, um, it will over the next two decades. Um, I just feel like, you know, Charlottesville Albemarle is a little bit more insulated than some of the surrounding counties. Um, it's kind of what I saw a little bit in 2007-8. I just started investing, so I was caught up in a couple flips, and then the market just tanked, and I was like, oh gosh, I was 24 years old and thought I was in trouble, but I, honestly, I did okay, and I think a lot of that was just because I had chose to invest in Charlottesville Albemarle. So my rents were high enough to cover my debt and save me from some losses and hold properties that if I had been in the surrounding counties, I may not have been able to hold. Do you think having uh, the internet availability um, hmm. in today's market kind of unburdens that, and some of and what we're we're seeing as far as uh, EV and so people who are let's let's assume that the cost to commute for some individuals gets lower and for them actually not having to commute at all, um, even into the you know surround as surrounding counties have more high speed internet access or if Elon's Musk satellites ever actually start doing what they're said they're to do um, Elon uh, Musk comes up a lot when you're on the show Scott now I'm a you know you're, you're a fan of Elon uh, I'm a Admirer I don't of Elon. I don't mind the headlines okay. uh, but yeah. uh, you know the some of what he does has uh, you, we're in a world where that has real life effect to things um, much larger than Elon's bank account, which is way overvalued, and so is all his stock. So that's what I, I <laughs> okay. There we go. I like that. But uh, assuming that some of this stuff like starts to work, it, does it expand what where those rents could actually be? Because these people don't have to be directly connected. They don't have to be plugged in on commuting 15 minutes. They can be 40 minutes away. Does that make sense? I Absolutely. Got, I got sense. a little off track there. No, that no, makes sense. No, I, I follow the question. Um, I think you're right. I think that things could change. Um, I, I still believe, though, that uh, people want to be near things to do. People like the Trader Joe's. People like, you know, the downtown mall. And, and you're not going to, you know, you're not going to have that right now if you're up in Standardsville, right? Or if you're not, not yet, you know. So, yes, you're right from the from the. With, with internet speeds getting better. Let's talk Zions and West End Richmond. Like, as that's starting to become more of... Well, that place is blowing up. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and places like that could be great opportunities for, for investors. I, I mean, West End Richmond ain't cheap, though. Yeah. What are you talking? You're talking the West End, or are you talking Shore Pump specifically? Or are you talking both? I'm talking both. I mean, it... West so End Richmond is pretty Tony. It is, but you can be five minutes on, like, pouncy track, and uh, you're in, like, affordable, you know, type of living. So for three and a half decades, the conversation has been Zion's Crossroads and Richmond growing, and it's happening, right? It, it, it is happening, and it's daisy-chaining itself a little bit into the middle, in, into the middle, into the middle of it. Um, uh, just a quick little stat from NAR. Um, 87% of the millennial buyers last year moved out to suburbs, moved out to rural environment, 87% of them. You know why that is? I mean, it's the quintessential American dream. The backyard and the picket fence for our kids to play in with the, the German shepherd at the lab running around. And that trend has been going on pre-COVID. It's just the numbers are just picking up, picking up a little bit, a lot, I think, to do with the work at home, the, this hybrid that I think and we're going. And the increase of people who are coming of age for said dream. Like, that's part of 23. the... 23.5 million of them. That's a big number. Julie Ballard in the mix. Spring Creek is exploding. Yeah. She says, Julie Ballard, the realtor. And, I mean, you could speak to that. I can. The first deal in Spring Creek history. Well, I don't know Spring Creek's history, but we, we have a, a residential construction going there with a one in front of it. Not a hundred. Oh, a a seven-figure wow. deal in Spring Creek yeah. in Louisa wow. County. It's going to be a nice house. It, it, it will be a nice house. Wonderful people. It, it's it's going to be a great, great deal, but it's a new construction with the one in front of it. If I had told you a couple years ago that would have happened, would you have? I remember when they were giving stuff away there. Well, Where, that's like the first, uh, first million-dollar house in Belmont. I was like... You know, that was, what, three or four years ago at this point. It, it was and funny. Um, on Friday, um, it's uh, Ragged Mountain's Run Shop 40th anniversary, and, and I was talking to Mark, and, and he's been in it 40 years. I've been in 35 years, and we were just having this conversation, like, 
you know, two old dudes going, do you remember in 1988 and nine how this was? So things change, things grow. It's just, it's just the way it is. Um, but I also, with that 15 year spreadsheet that I've been talking about, I've also ran, been running percentage appreciation year over year over year. And depending on the area, including the great time of unpleasantness, it's roughly three to 5% year over year. And, and I think what you're saying, Gary, is, is we're gonna get to more stable growth, more stable growth in appreciation, not this double digit, which is yeah. so everybody. When I say cool down, I'm not, I'm not talking 2007 and eight. I'm just saying we can't continue to appreciate at the rate that we 16% are. 16% is bonkers. It just doesn't work. And, and it's funny, and you two guys have these conversations all the time. When you have a conversation with a client going, yeah, it needs to slow down, do they kind of look at you weird and go, but aren't you in this business? But we want it to, to stabilize, right? Would you, would you agree? I mean, I think a balanced market or more balanced market um, is a better real estate market. Because you guys are in the people business. Yeah. I mean, and the last thing you guys want to do, I mean, I don't want to speak for you. The last thing you guys want to do is to drive deals. I mean, probably not the last thing. I mean, I'm sure you guys enjoy doing this as well. But driving deals to super deep pocketed people and not helping first time home buyers actualizing the, the concept of an American dream of buying a home. Yeah, you can't grow generational wealth if you price all those people out of the market. Yeah, and that's happening, especially here. Gary, you answered that question perfectly. Thank you for saving my poorly <laughs> asked question. But uh, I, I, we've been doing this for a long time, my wife and I. Um, we don't buy leads. We don't do anything. Every single one of our transactions are a referral of some sort. They've ever seen it on the show or we've done. And, and if you take this transactional approach, you won't get that referral. Right. right, and and that's just the way you grow this business is you take care of people, and and sometimes you got to tell them what they don't want to hear, right? And uh, but uh, you're on the right track, brother. You're, you're doing great. How about the uh, the University of Virginia's impact on this? That's a lead for Friday's promo for you. Um, but the University of Virginia's impact on this market, Gary Palmer, and how it's positive and potentially how it could create some negative ramifications. So which project are we talking about? I'm just talking about UVA having such an influence on the market. Oh, okay, just UVA in general. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, there's pros and cons for sure, but I, by and large, I think that UVA is a great, I mean, it's, it's a staple of Charlottesville. Um, I think it draws a lot of people here. I mean, people love the games. Um, I mean, I know sometimes with all the students, you can get a little, you know, caught up in that traffic over on West Main sometimes, and you're like, gosh, there's kids everywhere. But, I mean, I love UVA. I, I think it's a great thing for the town. I mean, this is a college town. It's one of the reasons I moved here. Um, when I was, you know, 22, um, you know, I liked the UVA football games. I was looking to start up a contracting company, and me and my partner, we, we liked Charlottesville. And UVA had a lot to do with that. That's what brought me here, so. It, it's, the, it's the 20-ton elephant in the room, right? It's the one I wouldn't be sitting here. You wouldn't be sitting here. Jerry wouldn't be sitting here. It's it's the driver of our of our region. It's also the stabilizer of our region, right? It, it, to to Scott's point, when we talk about being insulated, that's yeah. part of what keeps it that way. Right, versus Southwest Virginia or or right. some other yeah. some other area. I think what Jerry was trying to throw me a softball on Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, we we have Kolechi and Alice Rooker from. UVA, and if you've been following the news, um, they are, are UVA is committed to uh, affordable housing and mm -hmm. uh, assisting in between 1,000 and 1,500 units. I'm on their community engagement team mm -hmm. for that end of it, and we're going to sit here and we're going to have a, a you know a conversation about it. and And uh, it was huge that they asked to come here and, and join Jerry and I and, and do this. and And uh, so, if you're friable on Friday, chime in. Jerry's fingers will yeah. be flying with questions, I'm sure, mm -hmm. and and uh, chime in. Sure. Any uh, final thoughts, fellas? Scott Morris? Um, no, just uh, same thing as always. Like, uh, you know, control your controllables. Enjoy. Uh, make good decisions. If there's any questions, reach out to, a, you know, trusted advisor, Gary, Keith, myself. Let me know if there's anything I can do for you. And uh, help, as many as people, help as many people as possible. Gary, um, thank you for being here. It was great to have a a developer on the round yeah. table that I can have a conversation with. Great I hope, guy. Hope I didn't geek out no, too much, no. too much on it. Um, 
And this is the first time we've really got to know each yeah, other, so yeah. I'm excited. Other than a few transactions we've done. This yeah. is the first time we've been face-to-face. Um, uh, yeah. Well, now I have to ask, did, did I do okay? <laughs> no, I, I appreciate it, <laughs> Jerry. Thanks, Scott, Keith. Mm-hmm. You guys have been great. Uh, made this easy for me. I'm not the best on camera, so. Dude, you uh, did great. Uh, fantastic. You, know, I, fantastic. you guys make me feel comfortable, and I've enjoyed the conversation today. You did great. You did great. Appreciate Keith it. Smith, Scott Morris, Gary Palmer. I'm Jerry Miller, Judah Wickhauer, the glue behind the mm-hmm. scenes, the director of the program. This is um, Real Talk presented by Ross Mortgage and uh, the, uh, the dapper uh, Scott Morris. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take dapper. I'll yeah. take dapper. Uh, always hitting the long ball. <laughs> Scott Morris. <laughs> right. uh, we like that guy quite a bit. Um, the I Love Seville show is up in one hour and two minutes with Jim Hingley, mm-hmm. Almore Commonwealth's attorney, um, on the program. It's going to be a good one, guys. We'll see you very shortly. Take care. Gentlemen, thank you. Right on, man. Excellent work. Okay, cool. See, Thanks, I told you, laid back, conversation. It does go by fast, right?